Hey, Walter Sorrels back with more tips for the knife maker. Today we're going to make a Japanese style blade from a barrel. Traditional Japanese swords are made with a complicated construction which consists of an exterior skin of very hard steel and then a softer steel that's on the interior of the blade. Now the purpose for this is to make the blade uh, more resilient so that you can strike things with it and the blade won't break in half and yet you can still maintain a very hard um, cutting edge that you don't have to sharpen all the time. So what we're going to do today is a pretty cool little uh, trick. We're going to actually take a, um, a barrel of some nameless old uh, rifle and we're going to um, fit a soft steel inside of it. We're going to forge weld that together and then we're going to make a uh, blade that kind of mimics the characteristics of a traditional Japanese sword uh, from these modern ingredients. Now this is a very complicated project with a lot of different elements, so I'm probably going to break it up into about three different uh, videos. First one, uh, today's video is going to just focus on the forging of the blade. Traditional Japanese swords were made by forge welding a soft steel core to a harder skin steel. We're going to mimic that here by forge welding a mild steel rod into the barrel of some nameless old bang stick. This blade was suggested to me by a viewer, Andrew Audsley, about a year ago. He was kind enough to send me this barrel, so at long last, Andrew, I've gotten around to doing the project. So the first thing we need to do is to find out whether this steel can even be hardened at all. If it can't, it's game over, so let's give it a test. First, I'll cut off a piece of the steel and hit it with a hammer. As you can see, the material deforms, it squashes, showing that it's in a relatively soft state right now. I'll heat it up to about 1500 degrees in my forge and quench it in a bath of engineered quenching oil. If it's capable of hardening, this process ought to get the job done. All right, time to hit it with the old two pound persuader again. Perfect. This time the steel shatters, indicating that it's hardened. So this steel should work fine for our project. I'll cut the tube to a manageable size, then clean out the bore with heavy grit sandpaper and this jury rig flap sander. If the interior of the bore still has lead or copper fouling, rust, other crud, it could compromise the weld. So, I'll clean up the bore as much as I can. I'll also clean up the surface of the mild steel rod to remove all the mill scale. Mill scale would definitely ensure that the weld would fail. After welding on a handle made of rebar, I'll drill a small air hole at the base. When I insert the rod, it's going to be hot and covered with flux, which would tend to seal the bore, making this into a sort of pneumatic piston, which in turn would likely prevent me from being able to insert the rod. Ultimately, I'll want to pinch the tip shut so that the tip of the knife is composed 100% of hardenable steel. So obviously, I have to make the rod shorter than the bore of this tube. In this case, it's around half an inch shorter. Now comes the fun part. I'll begin by heating both my tube and rod, then dusting them with borax flux, which will help clean the welding surfaces and ensure a good weld. Now it's a little tricky getting this to work because the rod's expanded from the heat, the flux is messy, the steel's softened a bit. Ultimately I had to get off camera, but eventually I was able to wrestle the rod into the bore. I'll bring it up to heat. Before forge welding, I'll lightly pinch the tip. I don't want it welded shut at the beginning because that would trap the flux inside, 
which would cause inclusions that would mess up the weld. I want it all to squeeze out that hole before it welds shut. So once I've reached forge welding temperature, about 2400 degrees, I'll squash it in my hydraulic press. In a perfect world, I'd use a squaring die, but the world is not perfect. My squaring dies are made for much larger stock, so I'll just use the flat dies, working as quickly as humanly possible, trying to get it welded on all sides. Back into the forge, back up to welding temperature, rinse and repeat sealing the tip shut and giving me that 100% hardened portion that will serve as the tip of the knife that I'm ultimately going to make from this billet. Now it's just a matter of flattening it into a bar. Has it welded properly? I won't know for sure until later. However, there's no bulging, no obvious evidence of delamination, so I'm feeling pretty hopeful. The next step in forging is to forge a preform, or what's known as a tsunobe by Japanese smiths. Just a footnote here, there are some Japanese sword fanboys who think that anything in the Japanese sword realm that deviates in any way from the tools, materials, and techniques used by Masamune in the 14th century is somehow a terrible offense against Japanese swordom. Now to me this is kind of ridiculous. What we're doing here is not intended to be and not represented to be a Japanese sword in the traditional sense. Rather we're showing how different tools, materials, and techniques can be used to achieve similar ends to those used by Japanese smiths a long time ago. Let's face it, we're just having fun here. So forging the preform looks fairly simple-minded. What you end up with looks sort of like a crowbar. There's no edge on it, no bevel, but actually this part of the process has to be done very particularly, building in all the correct tapers and proportions. If you don't, it's impossible to impose the correct geometry when you go to bevel the blade in the next phase of forging. If you're curious why I'm leaving the bar attached to the welded handle, it's just because forging a blade with tongs is always a bit of a pain in the neck. Tongs are just never as secure as holding something directly with your hands. Later I'll have to hot cut the bar free of the handle and use a pair of tongs, but I'm just not there yet. Now the Sunobe is complete, so I'll go ahead and forge the bevels. You'll notice that I actually bevel starting on the side that appears to be the spine. The reason for this is that the blade actually curves toward the spine as you forge it. So that preform has built the curvature into what appears to be the wrong side of the blade. I'll be laying in the bevels about four or five inches at a time. Typically I work one side, then I flip it over and work the other side, then back to the first side, then back to the other side again. Usually it takes me four heats to do each section of four to maybe even six inches depending on how thick the blade is. Then I just work my way all the way up from the tip to the tang. This part looks more interesting and dramatic than the previous phase of forging, but I actually find it's less demanding in many ways than forging the preform.
once I get to the point where I need to start working the tang, I'll hot cut the blade free and then do the rest holding it with tongs. For those not familiar with the construction of Japanese blades, Japanese blades are forged so that the bevels extend all the way through the tang. Japanese sword furniture is made to slip on and off, not only so that it goes in and out of a scabbard, but so that the handle can actually be pulled off and you can remake a new handle and put it right back on. By having the blade carry on the tapers of the bevels, it just makes it easier to take that handle on and off and to replace it. Now at a somewhat lower temperature, I'll make final corrections to bring everything into line for the exact shape and size that I want. Once I'm done, I'll normalize the blade, heating it up several times to about 1600 degrees. And there we have it, a forged blade. For those of you not acquainted with Japanese sword nomenclature, what we're making here is known as a tanto. The western style blades referred to as tanto point blades, nothing to do with this. Somebody cadged the name of the traditional Japanese fighting knife for an American production blade with a chisel point tip several decades ago and it stuck. But that meaning of the word came about well over a thousand years later than the original meaning. All right, so we've wrapped up the forging of the blade. Next, we're gonna move on to uh, shaping that blade a little bit more, and then we're gonna heat treat it. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!